I'd like to move on to a lady who has actually broken the glass ceiling way, way before. And um, that at that time, it was considered such an impossible task. And she's here with us now. We're very, very honored here at AIBD to welcome her, Dr. Kiran Bedi, the first woman in India to have joined the officer ranks of Indian Police Service, or IPS, way back in 1972. And she looks still beautiful and young. And she has stood for her policing, stood for power to correct, power to prevent, and power to get things done. Honorable Dr. Bedi also served as police advisor to the Secretary General in United Nations in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, New York. She's a recipient of the Ramon Maxese Award and has authored several books and has a biopic on her life called Yes, Madam Sir. I'm definitely going to read that. And she has been in the vanguard of a nationwide India against corruption movement and is running two NGOs. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the session the Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry, Her Excellency, Dr. Kiran Bedi, a huge celebrity in India. Madam, we welcome you on board. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philomena, for inviting me to such a privileged uh, event. Thank you so much. I will divide my presentation two parts. One is my opening remarks, and the other is what helped me break the glass ceiling. So I'll go straight to the actionable points as part two of my presentation. First, I would like to say as an opening statement, that real change, my friends, will come when powerful women are less of an exception. We are too much of exceptions. I would say the real change will come when more powerful women are less of an exception. It's happening, but it's happening steadily. And that they remain exception. By practicing excellence, not as a skill, but as an attitude. So excellence is an attitude now. Behind every successful woman is she herself. And then her family who trusted her, whether the society trusted or not is a, is a matter of region, is varies place to place, but whether her family supported her and trusted her. I wish to make a very clear remark that while generations work to empower women, but they forgot to teach the men how to live with empowered work and live with empowered women. And that is what we are getting to embattle on a daily basis. I was raised to believe that self-reliance is the best deterrent to my survival, self-esteem and self-growth. And I go back to the late early 50s. And that women, as my father and mother told me, that you are the real architects. You don't have to go to an engineering college of architecture. You are an architect. And that development will one day be led by women as well. I'm not excluding men. And that I will be my own woman. And that in our society, women who break down barriers, if I would, will be those who will ignore limits. So I was tra trained early on, how do I ignore limits? Now, my part two of the presentation is what made me uh, break the glass ceilings and I'm today 71. I can claim to say how I did it. Still doing it as long as there's energy enough in me to do it. Number one was what made my life easy. Section one. What made my life easy was my creating of support systems. Relationships are paid for, but creating support systems I created ladders and platforms, and I created springboards. That means parent support, which meant uh, peer support, people support, and friend support. So friends, peers, family, and friends. All that could be possible. I created the support, and I continue to do that. And I continue to do use the power of communication by visibility and by transparency. Media and social media is an integral part of my day. But it's a power of communication, not self-promotion. It's to communicate. Then comes good health. I retained energy. I, had, I was blessed with good energy. I did retain and generate energy on a regular basis. And most of all, that I retained the hunger 
to work as I do, as I did, and then as working out of a total sense of security. My part two is what made my glass ceiling, breaking the glass ceiling very tough. Number one, and it still is, one lack of resources anywhere you work. And I've worked with government, as we know government is never having adequate resources. Secondly is a creating a work culture. We suffer from a huge negative work culture or a routine work culture where you have to undo so much to get things done. So it's a work culture. Secondly is the lack of support from many seniors. Many colleagues is, is a lack of support, which is not unusual. But this is what made my life tough. I'm not saying difficult, tougher. And, and then the peer sabotage, which is always there, which is also with the men. So it's nothing unusual. It's the pure sabotage, but little added on because I was a woman. And last but not the least is the manner in which I made my family also go along with me in, in, in the kind of adversities I went through. My part three is how I broke the glass ceiling by some good practices I followed. Number one, maximizing field visibility. Wherever I had a field assignment, I have maximized field visibility. I showed up, whether I was in traffic police assignment as a young woman, or I was in police training to show up in every class, or whether I'm a lieutenant governor as administrator, is to show up on my morning rounds, not to be seen and visible, or to resolve and understand issues. My second thing is constant feedback. That's a very critical thing, because you, you are dependent and value feedback Two way. I give feedback, I get feedback through lunch meetings, through uh, feedback boxes, through um, 10 a.m. meetings or team meetings, depending on the situation you are in, what is the good time or today the visuals or the virtuals today. Then coming, raising community resources. For instance, when we were short of funds in, uh, in, in desilting of, of irrigation canals in uh, Puducherry two years ago, we didn't give up. We wanted water table to improve. We went to corporate social responsibility and desilted hundreds of kilometers of canals and ponds. We went to so raising community resources, whether it was in a prison assignment which was community oriented and NGO driven. Similarly, regular communications through I've already mentioned, which is so critical. Otherwise, how would you get a feedback? And last but not the least is merit-based compassion. Always merit-based compassion, which doesn't show your uh, weakness, but it shows your humanity. Now, five leadership beliefs I believe in, which I think are critical to anybody in leadership, man or a woman, but certainly women who want to break the glass ceiling. Number one, stay focused on your higher purpose. I have a higher purpose. Design your, divine your higher purpose and stay focused on it. Therefore, avoid trusting in destiny, Stay focused. Stay a karm yogi. That's the yoga word of being karmic. Means continue to do what best you can do. As per the Gita philosophy itself, you do best you can and leave the results. So karm yogi is being trusting in destiny, but staying focused on a higher purpose. Second, constant evaluation. It's like a personal reflection, which is an ongoing audit of your mind. A delete and an audit and replenishment. Third is never let monotony set in. Look out for new ventures. Look out for new opportunity. Meet new people. Go to new areas willing to learn through now, today, virtual methods. Fourth, very critical, is remain grateful for whatever anybody does for you, including you today for inviting me to such a lovely event, is gratitude. And then most important is living up to the trust you are creating, which is audio and video must match. You can't be saying something else and doing something else. There should be an, a remaining authentic. And last but not the least is very important, my friends, is that crucibles for women are your real tests. For me, when I get a crucible, that's my real test. How do I? COVID is a very big crucible to me as a leader today. And even when the law doesn't define my clearly my role as an administrator, how do I handle this crucible? I found my own ways of doing it. Is uh, second is line, lines are very clearly drawn. I don't let the certain lines blur in personal and professional relationships. So it's crucibles to lines drawn, and then valuing health. Look, today COVID teaches us one of the biggest lessons 
is it's not wealth which is more important it is health health you have you will generate wealth no health no wealth only wealth maybe no health or maybe very expensively earned so valuing time valuing support and last but not the least is stop fearing fear once you stop fearing fear you will have a sense of freedom in all that you do once again within my 10 minutes time you gave me i thought i will rather than narrate a thing give you headers and headlines and issues which i think give you so many ideas now for more of your conferences you can probably uh, discuss them on every one subject thank you so much once again philo and you've just made all of us feel that you know no matter what our age it is the way we feel and the way we move on and hunger for knowledge that's going to get us where we are now i also want to ask uh, women about um, what they're doing and um, the kind of things the challenges that they're facing so um, i'd like to ask dr kiran bedi first to tell me what is one of your biggest challenges that you faced in your way up was it women themselves or was it guys that's a tricky question sometimes women say that their biggest um, thing is fear right sometimes it's women stopping women but can you tell me what's your biggest challenge that you faced in your life i think meeting my own expectations okay meeting your own expectations absolutely so how did you how did you overcome that i mean that's something that you're working towards perfection yes meeting my own expectations how do i meet the challenges i'm entrusted with because i'm a very conscientious person once i take a responsibility i fulfill it to the hilt and being very self driven i don't wait i don't complain i seek solutions so where do i get them so my mind then works where are my resources where are my resources so that i meet the expectations of the people because i'm a public servant i'm here to fulfill an expectation people look up to you to meet their needs how do i get to continue to meet their needs so it's my own expectations setting my own bar and then crossing those limits to have people in abundance so how do i give people abundance of security abundance of everything i'm a basically a mother at heart when i'm at work and the question is in spite of a terrible structural barriers what are the biggest opportunities that empower women to fight against injustice what needs to be strengthened i think uh, dr betty with dr betty can uh, take this question is i think expeditious justice expeditious justice delivery system if they make a complaint to the police the police is response immediate a counseling center picks it up and the court takes cognizance and if the punishment is given while the crime memory is still alive it will spread a very strong detritus and then mobile clinics available if she calls 100 or she calls 199 or 99 911 there is a counseling center with women cops attending to her i think that will prevent and also give her the confidence all right what kind of public policy do you think the government can do for assisting women and also what kind of role the private sector can play to help women more so during this covid-19 situation so this question is from uh, yi yang ming mini i would think open up more helplines open up more helplines government should open more helplines for any kind of questions to be answered a government scheme or an opportunity so i think private sector and the government if opens helplines on toll free numbers it will help them even including prevention of domestic violence which very many women are suffering from in covid times so opening more helplines by the government and also professional opportunities career counseling etc by the private sector and the government sector will go a long way at the moment home working from home needs a listening if somebody can listen to them talk to them converse with them and counsel them and guide them or or just converse to find out what is the option they need to converse who do they converse because they are stuck with their own little environments so they can connect it connectivity i think private sector and they should open up helplines toll free numbers private sector government sector very interesting answer uh, dr kiran i'm also wondering who will man this helplines 
in view of the COVID situation. No, government, <laughs> no, no, my friend, government is help, has helplines. We got control rooms. We got control. Don't we have police control rooms? Why can't we open helplines? And it can be also virtual. You don't need to be manic. You can also, everybody can work from home. So a helpline can go. Police is on, 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 the, on the round. Healthcare is on the round. And the opening up of lockdown, business is back on the ground. So it's not that they're not available. I think helplines is the need of the hour, even in prevention of domestic ones. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity result to thank all women gathered here. I think it has been a very, very interesting um, time that we had together. We had crossed more than two hours, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for staying. But I would like to mention here that one of the greatest inspirations I've gathered today, and I think most women who are sitting here with me today would say that Dr. Bedi is the living testimony of changes taking place for women. And we're talking about women in, in your time, doctor, and right now, right? And uh, it's wonderful that you are out there still empowering women through your TED Talks. And thank you so much for coming on board.